The Solar Podcast is brought to you by Continental Energy Solutions. I'm your host, Tim Montague. Check us out at cesnrg.com. Today on the Solar Podcast, the importance of grid interactive buildings and a more reliable grid. My guests today are Mark Kleinginna, founder of Integral Energy, and Jared Rodriguez, founder and principal of Emergent Urban Concepts. Welcome to the show, Mark and Jared. Thanks, Tim. Thank you. Great to be here. Here we sit in April of 2021 on the heels of a major grid collapse in ERCOT in Texas, which killed, uh, according to your notes, Mark, I think 70 people died. Right. So, but it's, it's a major natural disaster on the order of hundreds of billions of dollars, right? That it costs the economy and consumers so it's a, it's a disaster on the scale of Hurricane Katrina, which I did not realize that it was, uh, you know, at that scale of a disaster. But um, and there's a bunch of things going on besides the grid collapse. The grid right. is changing. We are electrifying the grid. We are electrifying heating. Uh, we are adding lots of distributed energy to the grid, which is intermittent. We're adding lots of batteries. It's a very dynamic situation. So we're going to get into something called active power management that you guys are experts on and how to make the grid more reliable. Before we do that, Mark, please introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your practice. Sure. Thanks, Tim. Uh, I'm Mark Kleinginna. Um, I'm the founder of um, Integral Energy. Uh, I, uh, it's a, a small one-person consulting shop. We focus on uh, procurement um, and uh, uh, sustainability issues uh, for uh, for a number of different clients around the country. Excellent. And yourself, Jared? Yep. Uh, Jared Rodriguez. I'm the founder of Emergent Urban Concepts. It's a consultancy that works with uh, large real estate firms, municipalities, state agencies uh, on everything from policy issues to planning um, to systemic infrastructure issues. Uh, sustainability, climate adaptation, um, and resiliency. Excellent. And you guys have written a very detailed white paper, which we will uh, put a link to in the show notes. And you've also done a nice case study on what caused the grid collapse. So let's let's start off with what went wrong in Texas. And, and Texas is just one case. There are many other examples, as you point out, of these of, of, of events, and there's a lot of similarities and some differences uh, to these to these outages. But what went wrong in Texas, and um, how do we avoid that in the future? So yeah, I mean, I, there there have been a lot of a lot of folks who've done a very very nice job all all across the uh, the space in, in detailing what happened on the supply side in Texas. Uh, fundamentally, there there were uh, a, a number of different types of generation resources that were out. Uh, a, lo a lot of natural gas was out, a lot of coal was out, and also a lot of a lot of wind didn't show up. Uh, it wasn't necessarily unexpected that the wind wouldn't show up, but it, it wasn't there, and neither was neither was solar. And we actually lost a nuclear unit, so it's it's well documented what happened on the supply side. In fact, I think one of the thing one of the real findings was that there was a significant feedback loop between the natural gas side and the, and the power side, where um, you know you you lost a natural gas plant, but that meant you had to cut load, and so then you lost natural gas compression, which meant you lost some more gas plants, and so there was this kind of kind of death spiral that. Luckily, we were uh, luckily the folks at ERCOT were able to stop um, with uh, with load shed. Uh, but but our look at this, or my look at this, is that um, fundamentally there was a significant lack of understanding of the demand side of what was going on in, in Texas, primarily due to the, the fact that there's 61 percent of all the heating in Texas is electric. Uh, it's it's it's, it's electric and it's air source heat pumps or resistance heating, which uh, as, as, the, um, as the temperature goes lower, what happens is you have significantly lower efficiencies 
uh, and, and Texas was hit with some pretty significant uh, below freezing temperatures for a long period of time. And this caused those, those air source heat pumps to be much less efficient than, than uh, people thought they were going to be. And that led to a miss in the demand. Uh, the the, uh, the SARA put out in November by ERCOT had a, an extreme peak at 68,000 or 68, 68,000 megawatts or 68 gigawatts. And they, when, when the, the, the uh, uh, when it was all said and done, it was it, if they hadn't shed load, it would have been about 76 gigawatts or six, 76,000 megawatts. That's a pretty significant miss. Somewhere between eight and 10,000 megawatts, you know, it's it's 15% of the load. Uh, and, and failure to understand that, uh, I, I think, is, is one of the things that um, it, it needs to be, you know, put forward it, it, as, as they plan these things going forward. So that's the, that's the piece of, uh, uh, of this that I think is very important to understand as we move to greater and greater electrification, not just in Texas, but in, in places like uh, like the, the Midwest and the Northeast. Yeah, you know, I've also heard that it almost was a lot worse. Is that true? Jared? Yeah. Um, you know, just going back to the uh, conversation about the, the gas supply and the feedback loop. Uh, as we lost gas compression, more units went offline and they had to um, trigger planned outages and, and blackouts of certain nodes on the network. Um, you know, Mark made a really good point in a, in a presentation he made to um, some New York state officials that if ERCOT went full black, uh, it could have taken several weeks to bring it back up to, to voltage. Um, just because of the way that you need to bring on uh, particular nodal networks inside inside the full the full network um, before you can uh, reconnect, so you have to bring it up to voltage before you can reconnect to the larger network, um, which necessarily takes a lot of time to do. So if we were out in ERCOT for several weeks, um, there's also the potential that pressure in the transcontinental pipelines that extend from the Gulf Coast to the Northeast, natural gas pipelines uh, could have crashed. And in February, we need all the natural gas that we could get in the Northeast um, to provide max, max heating uh, loads. So this could have been uh, much worse <laughs> um, for the entire country, particularly during a pandemic. Uh, you know, we could have seen many thousands of deaths um, so thank God it didn't happen, but it's not a good feeling that uh, we've built this very complex system that can kind of topple over quite easily. And, and immediately during and after the disaster in ERCOT, there were fingers being pointed at distributed energy resources. Now, clearly some wind turbines did fail. They were not weatherized for super cold weather, right? So the components do stop working. Um, up here in the Great White North, uh, you know, in Northern Illinois, turbines don't stop working in the winter. They're happily cruising along. Mm -hmm. And uh, so there's all kinds of infrastructure issues, some with distributed resources, but the bulk of the failure was more about traditional uh, thermal and nuclear resources, was it not? It, it is, I mean, I just, I'll step in, you know, and kind of zooming out a little bit, it's a thermal fail, failure across the board, right? We're not thinking about our buildings as thermal storage resources, right? There's very little insulation in the state of Texas. Um, we're not thinking about our heating systems as potentially being uh, resources that can draw out the amount of time that, that, uh, that you have to, to either heat or store Right, a building so you could ride out outages. Um, we're, you know, we're not we're not thinking about that in these southern states. Um, they're also not thinking that, uh, you know, climate climate change could cause the collapse of like the polar vortex and we have Arctic conditions down at the Mexican border, um, which will be a recurring problem for us. Um, so, you know, this is just a failure to understand uh, like thermal, um, either on the supply side right? Or even on the demand side. And I will tell you that is not unique to Texas. I think the entire country is failing to understand this issue. Um, and we are hurriedly towards, uh, you know, some difficulty if we don't start to learn more about it. Yeah. And, and so the other, 
you know, large scale transition that we're going through is we are weaning ourselves off of gas and oil for heating and converting to electric uh, furnaces using heat pumps and mini splits. And uh, I, I happen to have consulted with a manufacturer that you know, includes a, mini, a, a heat pump in their, in their ventilation device. So I, I know a fair amount of, about heat pumps. And as Mark pointed out, their efficiency goes down when it gets cold. And so they're drawing a greater amount of energy from the grid in order to get the same amount of heat out, so to speak. Um, but, but is that transition, where, where are we, I guess, in that transition? My sense is we're very early days in that transition towards electrifying heating, but give us a, give us a big picture on that. Yeah, could, could I, maybe I could take that one really quick. I think so, so yeah. Yeah, so I mean, one one of the issues that I think that we're, that we're dealing with, and I'm just going to ask everyone to zoom out a, a little bit again, um, is that narratives around dealing with climate change are emerging from California. Okay, that's just like, that's true. Okay, we've got the some of the largest firms, you know, like Tesla and others um, that are making the biggest strides in dealing with climate. Uh, and electrifying buildings and electrifying transportation and battery storage, et cetera, is coming from California. So the narrative is being determined by California. Does California directly translate to the Northeast? No, right? They don't have the thermal load. You know, perhaps they will when the polar vortex fails again at some point in the future, <laughs> but uh, they don't have to think about these things. That narrative is being directly imported into New York among activist circles. Um, and in policy circles. So there's a desire to rapidly deploy air source heat pumps across the Northeast, at least. Um, and it's in a way that isn't necessarily considering these issues around uh, the you know, peak, peak demand at very cold temperatures, right? How do we buy time at the coldest time of year, right? So that we're not riding at COPs of 1.0 or resistance electricity. Um, so uh, yeah, maybe Mark, you have something to add to that. No, I think, I, I think it's, I, I think the point you make is, is, is exactly right. I mean, Tim, you reside, you reside in the upper Midwest and, and, and the fact is that, that, that is a, a nice heat pump market um, until it goes below 32 degrees, right? And at that at that point, you probably have a you you, you may have a gas backup, you may have a, a, an oil backup. I know when I was in Western Pennsylvania, that's exactly what I had. I had heat pumps, and then I and then I had a a number two oil furnace in my in my basement. Um, but as you know, as we get off uh, get off of, of using gas and, and oil to heat, uh, we do get into this into this world of of heat pumps and um, that peak gets really ugly. I mean, the way that the way that we uh, do uh, do the peak in the Northeast right now is the middle sixth of Pennsylvania is a natural gas storage field. Uh, the, there's there's five billion cubic feet a day that it, it goes into New York State. That uh, at, at billion cubic feet of day of, of of natural gas that goes into New York State, and that translates into about fifty thousand megawatts of peak load, right? And, and not a peak load that you'd see in the daytime where it's, where it's a diurnal peak, it's across all hours because heating, the heating load doesn't look anything like the summertime load. Um, so, you know, one of the things that you, you'll often hear is, well, we can use battery storage to get around those peaks for, for the, you know, for, for, this, for this intermittent, for the intermittent resources, but you really can't because, because um, the, the peaks are much flatter in the wintertime and they, and, and they tend to stay much higher over time. You can't charge the battery overnight like you can in the summer. So you really run into what we call a thermal storage problem instead of a, of a battery or electricity storage problem. And I think, I, I think that's, the, that, that's the entire point. You know, just to, just to add to that really quick, um, you know, ask Elon Musk what he thinks about heating his cars and how it draws uh, down the capacity on his batteries, right? He'd rather be using those batteries to transport the car. Um, you know, talk to him about the efficiency of his vehicle when the heat is on. So, elect, you know, electric heating and electric battery storage are not compatible. They are not compatible. Um, and so we need to be thinking beyond this. We can't allow California narratives to drive narratives in cold places. 
Yeah, and the other and the other major trend, of course, that we're pursuing is electrification of transportation. And so we are going to double or triple the KWH consumption of the American grid in the next 20, 30 years, um, which ultimately is a good thing, right? Because we are going to wean ourselves off of fossil fuels, which is essential if we're going to stop climate change. Um, but let's get let's let's get into this. Like, uh, and then there's that other layer now of distributed energy resources being deployed at scale wind, solar storage. Um, what is what is your guys theme here with active power management? Is there some major uh, shift in thinking that has to occur? Or is it is it just going to be a gradual evolution? Mark, ahead, you, want to take, you want me to take that? Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> sure. We, we need to start thinking of uh, load centers, right, and buildings as grid assets, right? Like that's the first thing is buildings need to start functioning as grid assets, right? Either on the electrical side, but also on the thermal side, right? You can't distinguish. There's no distinction between them um, in cooling and heating and then just providing, uh, you know, electric service for all the electric demand that's that's occurring in the, in the building. Um, so, you know, we need to start we really need to start having a deep conversation about how to do that. Uh, and, you know, we think, we think there's a way, and, you know, this isn't new, there's, there's an entire DOE program around grid interactive buildings, um, but there is a way to have grid signals influence how a building functions um, from a heating, cooling, and then also from, uh, you know, an electric power consumption perspective. Um, and that really is, I think that's the basis of, of active power management and thermal management. Um, is that we can be thinking about voltage in a network, but also voltage in a building uh, and, and managing that in a way that um, generally reduces stress on the grid and local distribution networks. Um, Mark, do you think you could? Add sure. Yeah. yeah. I, I mean, <laughs> ultimately, you know, act, active power management is it, it, the other, the other uh, name for it is distributed voltage control. And, and, and really what it, what it to delve, you know, more deeply into uh, get it, get a little bit further into the weeds here on this uh, you know, what, what this, what this does is provide the, uh, the, the commercial building or, or the industrial building, the opportunity to condition the, uh, the current that comes across the meter to be something that is, that is more in line with what the voltage requirement of the equipment is. Uh, and, and, and consequently, when you do that, you'll lower, the, uh, you'll lower your consumption uh, you know, for, for the equipment, because what you're getting across the meter is 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 a voltage that's not optimal uh, from the utility. They can, you know, they can provide that voltage within a certain range. Uh, it doesn't have to be right at at, at what uh, um, at, at what your equipment requires. If you can condition that voltage behind the meter, then you can get to a situation where you've got uh, a, a significant. Uh, lowering of the amount of uh, amount of energy you use, and you get to uh, lengthen the the lifetime of your equipment because it's not using stuff at at at, at the wrong voltage, and it's usually a too too low a voltage is what's coming across from the from the utility. Um, so that's you know that's what we mean by active power management is is understanding what's coming across the meter, and then saying okay, this is the equipment that I've got behind the meter, and this is where the voltage should be. Um, we can lengthen uh, lengthen lives, lengthen the equipment life that way, but also um, you know lower the uh, uh, the consumption you know anywhere between four and eight uh, percent you know at at at, uh, at some of these voltages that the, that the utilities providing, um, and that voltage level gets uh, and, and the voltage um, drops and, and increases and swells gets more and more active and more and more volatile the more intermittent resources you add in the grid. So the guy who you know who develops the uh, uh, develops the, the very nice uh, rooftop solar down the street, OK, he's putting in and taking out at, at, at levels that that uh, uh, that can influence the voltage on the grid. And if you're if you've got stuff behind your meter that's that's subject to that and you will, um, you can have a situation where your voltages are going up a great up and down a great deal unless you've got some for some sort of uh, uh, of distributed voltage control that 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 uh, that provides this service to your to your loads. Yeah. So let's fast forward, though. Uh 
you know, and talk about a scenario where we have high penetration of wind, solar, and storage. Because mm -hmm. when you have a lot of batteries, I mean, in my mind, that is kind of a very good scenario. But there's there's some problem there, and I'm not, uh, and I'd like you guys to articulate that. Yeah, you know, um, I think battery battery storage is absolutely. I mean, it's absolutely an answer on managing uh, voltage, right, from a grid scale, uh, even potentially from a, a local distribution company's perspective on more local networks, right? That's that's very important. Um, that's important today in our building demand profile. Like we need that today, we need it right now. Um, what happens when power consumption and power demand profiles changes dramatically uh, on the load side, on the building side? Can battery storage come to the rescue? I would argue no, particularly mm -hmm. as you start to layer in thermal. thermal because demand. it's too short term and you need longer term storage? Mm -hmm. You need more diversity, longer term, uh, um, different different battery typologies that can produce either power or thermal energy across different time scales um, and at different levels of quality. Uh, so you know where we are kind of looking at a problem. We're holding a hammer. Everything looks like a nail, right? Because our only hammer is lithium-ion batteries right now. Um, you know we see things on the horizon that are coming on the electric side, but we're also just flat out ignoring thermal storage. Um, so well, what, about, be, what about what about hydrogen yourself. and what about liquid metal batteries? Yeah, yeah. I mean, all all answers, but that's on the electric side, right? We need to be managing demand um, on the thermal side, and just if you if you just look at the basic physics of it, it's imminently clear that managing thermal demand is a uh, much better bang for your buck than trying to um, supply wild loads with. Uh, electric battery storage, no matter what kind of technology it is. And you're talking about making buildings more efficient or what are you talking about? It's a combination. Yeah. Low dynamic, efficient. Um, how do you increase? It's this concept of thermal flywheel. How can it run for longer uh, without needing, you know, an energy input? Um, how do you reuse waste heat inside the building? Uh, how do you share heat across multiple buildings or in a district? Um, you know, this concept of thermal energy networks, is, I think, is just as important as uh, electric grid resiliency. So are you advocating combined heat and power, like at, at a community scale, like the Scandinavians and the Northern Europeans are doing? Or That's exactly right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, obviously, we want to be avoiding uh, new natural gas related infrastructure. Um, but there are other ways of doing it uh, that I think should be absolutely considered. So it's this inside the building and outside the building approach that has to happen holistically. And very few people are thinking of, about it from that complex perspective. You know, it's inherently a, a, a it's inherently a um, very interconnected complex problem that, that needs to be looked at from, from that lens. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mark, any? Sure. No, I, mean, I, 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 I think that, you know, I, I think that there's, there's a lot of, uh, uh, there's, there's a lot of thermal, uh, thermal mass or a lot of thermal storage that's, that we lose a lot, uh, you know, across, uh, you know, various different types of systems like the wastewater system and the drinking water system and, 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 and those types of things. I, I think that there, there can be a, a great deal of, of, uh, of thermal storage that, that can occur with with those types of uh, uh, those types of applications, even even the hot water heater at, at times in, in a home could be uh, could be very important for for that piece. Uh, I, I'd also say you know back back to the active power management pieces. If, if you can imagine um, you know a significantly more complex distribution system, right? So so there's no question that 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 a, that a battery is going to be very important in, in, in that situation. But or as as a battery owner, are you going to pledge your battery to providing? You know, it's providing voltage support, or you're going to pledge it. You know, which might come up, you know, once or twice a year, or you're going to, or you're going to, you know, pledge it to to providing, uh, you know, the opportunity to arb, 
uh, between day and night, right? I mean, it, and, and that's the that's the real question: is is the battery the best the best thing to provide voltage support when the utility doesn't even care about it? The utility is just delivering at whatever voltage range it can, and you're the you're the poor guy down the you know down at the end of the line who's taking this uh, uh, taking this juice at a certain voltage, which isn't the right answer for your for your equipment, and that's where the where the APM comes in. You're going to have even more you know even more of this type of thing if you're going Going to install in your building uh, EV charging stations, right? So if you're gonna if you're gonna live this this promise of V2G, V the number two G, right? So you're going to be you know charging at certain times and then having the having the uh, the vehicle give back power at certain times. Man, that's going to just, you know, what, what flows across the meter and what happens to the distribution system from a voltage perspective is going to be massive. So it, you know, that's why you need to manage, manage, do the active power management and manage that voltage a lot close, more closely than, than we're doing right now. In fact, right. one of the things that Jared and I were talking about getting on this uh, podcast with you, with you, Tim, was, hey, you know, maybe it makes sense to put these kinds of systems in where you're installing solar and storage, Right. To be, because what you want to do is condition the voltage that's going, you know, you're already in the box, right? You're already, you're already in the electrical box. Maybe it makes some sense to, you know, to, to put it to putting these types of systems in um, as you're installing the, the, uh, the solar and storage so that you've got the right voltage, both coming from the grid and coming from uh, coming off the, uh, off the solar bus and, and the battery. We, we might actually, we should probably step back and let the viewers understand that the utility is often pushing you more voltage than you need. Right. So that the customer on the downstream end of the network gets enough voltage to remain up and running, right? So you're if you're upstream, they're, they're pushing you more voltage than you need and you're paying for that, right? Your, your equipment inside your building isn't op operating like optimally, therefore you're paying for that excess voltage. I'm literally paying for it, dollars, dollars and cents. And so, you know, the active power management devices that could go on as a filter, right, against that issue, um, both let voltage get pushed downstream more efficiently, but it also stops you from paying for that excess that the utility is pushing to you. So I'm gonna put one of, the, one of your slides on screen uh, that that just points out all of these things: weatherization, uh, market design, promoting further interconnection to the rest of the North American grid. This is ERCOT specific, okay? Right, right. Um, promoting DERS, distributed energy resources like wind, solar, and storage, more price responsive demand side options, and and reg deregulation. Um, being in a deregulated state, I'm very curious to learn more about that. I don't think it's working very well, honestly, here in Illinois. But, um, but, I mean, this is a lot of stuff. And I, I hear you, Jared, that, okay, it's complex. It's a complex web. And, but, and seemingly the DOE is, is starting to grapple with this. Uh, with with I don't know what the program is called. Do you know what the program is called? Uh, DOE is working on grid interactive buildings, and then they have advanced battery storage and thermal storage programs that they're yeah. working on. So yeah. grid interactive buildings is is uh, that's that's like another thing that's not even on the slide, I guess. Um, but but where are you guys really shining a light? In, in a way that, uh, you know, if, if, if I'm an elected official or if I'm a code official or if I'm a uh, architect, you know, thinking about these problems, trying to design better buildings, what is, what is, the, what is the hook that you guys are offering the built environment? Well, I, I mean, look, you know, in, in these in these responses, um, you know, and, and, and you know, put the, to put this slide in context, right? The first the first three are you know are, are ones that, that that are pretty 
um, you know, the, uh, you know, pretty pretty obvious that that um, you know on the supply side that people are that people are doing. Um, you know, below that, the DERs and and, and storage. I think I think you know there, there's there's some really good stories that people are telling about. You know, HEB had these enchanted rock. Uh, you know, three six hundred kW uh, units there that had firm gas, and and HEB stayed up during this, and they you know they, they were they were very resilient. So the, the, I think that story is being told. I think the more demand responsive, um, you know. Options, I think that's something that, that really needs to really needs to be taken a hard look at. And, and, and I think that, you know, grid responsive buildings will, will do that. Ultimately, you know, order 2222, it, it allowing the um, the aggregation of of, you know, uh, of DERs will, will be very helpful because I think at, at some point you'll get a, a situation where instead of the poor guy sitting there being without his lights on or paying $9,000, right? Maybe he gets to say, you know what? I'm willing to pay $9,000 to not have my lights on, or you pay me $9,000 and I'll get my sleeping bag out. Right. I mean, that that kind of that, that kind of demand response, I think I, I think we're you know, we're fairly close to getting to and 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 uh, it, it's something that should be should be pushed even harder. Right. right. Um, even the ability to say, hey, you know what, uh, we'll lower your electric bill by 50 bucks, you know, a month for the, for the you know, for the next year. Um, if you're willing to let us turn your, your thermostat down to 60 three or four times. Right. Though that that kind of stuff, I, I I think is really out there. Ending deregulation, I, I mean, I you know that that to me is 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 anathema. I I'm I'm a I'm a dereg guy from from way back. I've I've been in the business, you know, in that business for thirty years. I, I think that's not something that Texas should do by any stretch. Um, but the real piece, the thing that's the thing that's in red there is is work to lower the peak, right? And 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 what does that mean? I mean, in in, in our you know in 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 Jared and, and and my look at it, I mean, we really need to to look at. What do thermal energy networks look like? Is there a way to keep that coefficient of production up around three and a half, or, or excuse me, coefficient of performance up around three and a half or, 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 or four instead of down at one? And, and and the way to do that is is through circulating, you know, circulating a, a heat transfer, uh, you know, a heat transfer mechanism that's that's not that's not air because air is at 20 degrees circulate water. That's at 50. I mean, that that's, that's a fairly, very, fairly simple way to do this. Can you, you know, can you hook that, you know, those thermal energy networks up everywhere in, in Texas? No, you can't, but there are places where, where it's going to make a lot of sense and where they've, they've, uh, uh, they've decided to do that. City of Austin has decided to, to, to do that and, ha and has, has district geothermal or district uh, heating there. So those are, those are the kinds of things I think that, you know, we see ultimately, uh, to, to be valuable and low, lowering that peak. And as we do this in the Northeast and Midwest, even more, um, it's going to be more and more, more important up here because, you know, Texas was a spike. It was a, you know, a, a one in 10, um, you know, we have one in three winners up here where, where the, uh, uh, where, where you could have a, a you know, significant, uh, you know, significantly lower uh, temperatures and we'll have to get through a week or so of, of, of that, that kind of deep freeze, um, you know, that, that won't be able to make it on an air source heat pump. Mark kind of touched on a couple themes, right, that I've been advocating for for, I don't know, 12 years. <laughs> uh, one of them is pro, you know, prosumerism and prosumer behavior. Um, you know, how do you enable a customer to give back, right, as much as they receive? Uh, that's everything from utility structure and rate cases to technology to culture, right? Um, you know, hyper hyper complex issue, but that's what we need to be doing. I mean, we need to be enabling prosumer behavior on thermal versus like electric loads, right? This thought that we're just, you know, electrify everything and then electric battery storage just to handle the wild peaks, <laughs> you know, on the, on the generation side and the demand side. Um, no, like we need to vanquish that idea uh, immediately. Thermal is for thermal. And electric is for electric. Heat pumps are the crossover. They're the bridge. Heat pumps condition heat, low grade heat to high grade heat and everything in between. That's what heat pumps do, right? And active power management devices can condition electric. So that's the way that we need to be thinking about it. Um, thermal is for thermal. Electric is for electric. 
stop trying to make one thing do the other thing because that's not what it's for. Are you guys familiar with extensible energy? Uh, not that term. Can, John, can John Powers it? is the CEO. It's a, it's a company and he has a tool called Demand X, EX, not just X. So Demand EX, but he's using building management uh, systems and software to control uh, demand, right? Mm -hmm. To to load shed basically, mm -hmm. and uh, you know a lot of this is done uh, quasi manually today here in Illinois in PJM. You know we'll get we'll get we have a battery at our office at Continental. We'll get a signal the day before. Okay, you're going to have a capacity day mm -hmm. tomorrow. And we're in the middle of the summer. We pre-cool the building, we turn down the lighting, we tell people to go light on their computer usage, uh, you know, for a two hour period, two to four in the afternoon, and we charge our battery up and then we attack that two hour window full steam. And, mm -hmm. it, uh, and it produces very generous savings. Uh, surely there are building management systems. Uh, I'm, no, I'm no geek on, on these, on these technologies i know it's a it's a fast moving space mm -hmm. we, we need smarter buildings right yeah yeah you know it's actually a highly highly crowded space <laughs> uh particularly in new york it's very mm -hmm. crowded there are a lot of firms doing this there's mergers mm -hmm. and acquisitions happening um auto dr directly integrating with the utility on this uh the the prosumer concept where even an individual homeowner can do this uh, yeah. and, sh and shift demand and then get paid and including apartment dwellers in multifamily buildings are engaging with a company called uh, Logical Buildings on their grid rewards program and they have an app. Um, that company has a partnership with Sa Samsung SmartThings mm -hmm. to deploy across their customer base with all of the different uh, you know, internet connected items that they have. Um, but what, is out, what else does Samsung do? I mean, they produce appliances. So why can't we have battery and thermal storage integrated appliances that help lo load shift, you know, in an apartment or in a single family home? Um, everyone is thinking about this, right? What, what I'm saying isn't new. It's just what are the narratives that are happening at the higher level in policy circles and with activists that drive a policy response? What are the narratives that are happening that can just get us doing the right thing instead of wasting time because we don't have any time, right? We just need to be on board and moving in the proper direction instead of going off on tangents about, um, you know, all electric buildings backed yeah. up with a lithium ion battery. No, that's silly. Like, let's please stop telling building owners that they need to do that because they're resisting and they're using their leverage, which is lobbying power to slay policy, like they're killing policy because they think that the answer is all electric buildings with lithium ion uh, battery backup. It's not the answer. So we've got to get out front of this narrative problem and fix it as soon as possible. So we don't keep having these um, different folks like talking past each other. Yeah. But it is part of the solution to have all electric buildings and batteries. That's part of the solution. It's not but the entire not solution. With, not with only air source heat pumps. Yeah. That's what that's critical. And certainly not with a resistance electric. You know, mm -hmm. in New York, we hear people talking about electric resistance boilers to make steam, to go to steam <laughs> radiators. I mean, people are saying that. Yeah. And that's not okay. Like, that's not okay. Um, we need mm -hmm. to just put that stuff to bed. Uh, and talk more about how to properly thermally manage, you know, on the building scale, on the neighborhood scale, on the city scale, and then statewide, and then regionally, right? Um, and well, I think so we can do, get do you want to do you want to paint us a picture though of the of the building of the future? Because yeah. it's it's pretty <laughs> it's pretty fuzzy to me so far. <laughs> <laughs> That's fun. Uh, okay, so here's one: um, a building that sits on top of a rail station in Midtown Manhattan. Okay, that building is at the terminus of, you know, two, actually way more than that, multi-mile long pipes. Those are railroad tunnels. Okay, heat can be drawn in through those railroad tunnels, which is being stored in the earth around the railroad tunnels. 
to feed a heat pump that never goes below a COP of seven, okay? If there are highly dynamic thermal loads inside that building, the heat that that heat pump is producing, right, can be stored either in the thermal mass of the building itself or in some other kind of storage medium that we don't necessarily know about today, right? There's some pretty major advancements happening in materials and phase change material, et cetera, where you could get high density heat thermal storage in small volumes uh, that can then be deployed, right? What I, what I said earlier about heat pumps being, you know, thermal conditioning devices, right? You could take low grade heat and ramp it up, right? For use at a higher temperature, or you could take high temperature heat, mix it with low grade heat, injecting heat as you need it. So you're drawing down that thermal battery slower and then use a heat pump to, to transform and condition that heat for use in the building. So we need to be looking at what are the sort of bespoke thermal resources that are adjacent to the building of the future, using that in every way possible, obviously making the envelope tight, making the building perform, doing all the things that we were talking about with IoT, right? And having like actual electric grid responsiveness as well. Um, but just thinking about ther you know thermal as a as a resource and as a I mean much like in the way that we think about electricity, I mean we understand the time value of electricity. You know even the most basic customer knows that electricity is more expensive, you know at certain times of of day, right? Like that's when there's demand. You know we know that gasoline can get more expensive, right, around Labor Day because of demand. You know heat needs to be the same way. We need to think about the time value of heat. And I think as soon as we start doing that, um, we're gonna get smarter with how we design and transform our buildings into what they need to be. And Europe's been doing this for, or they've been doing this for a really long time. I mean, Japan is way ahead of us. Japan's on an island, they don't have any resources, they had to do it. And Europe is at the end of a gun that Vladimir Putin is holding. So, you know, Mark always says it, Mark, I mean, I'll let you tell it. Why does, you know, Europe has a very defined enemy. Yeah, right. <laughs> and, 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 and I think, you're, you know, more, more to your point, Jared, you know, the, what you say about, about heat is, is, is really key. We don't, we don't have a, a, a particular price signal around, uh, around thermal uh, around thermal storage, you know, the, the, the gas utility, you know, comes in and charges you so much a decatherm, you know, regardless of what time of year it is, um, you know, you can, you can buy on the spot market and it costs more in the wintertime than it does in the summertime. But for the most part, you buy it, you, you know, even if you're taking third party, you, you buy it, you, you buy gas at a, at a certain, at a certain level and you lock it in and that's, and, and that's where it is. Uh, I, I don't think there's any there's any sensitivity around that. P people don't really don't really understand it, and that's I think because it's been so abundant, right? I mean, we have we have this this incredible fossil resource that exists in North America, and so we take we take it for granted. And and now that it you know now that it's more costly, whether whether it's by regime saying we're not going to have any pipelines that uh, go west of the or go east of the Delaware River, or whether it's by uh, the fact that uh, the street's not going to allow these guys to poke holes in the ground for 250 gas anymore um or whether we say that it, look it's just costing too much in terms of carbon that that therm or that btu is getting more dear and and as it becomes more dear um we need to start looking at that btu are there substitutes for it mm -hmm. is it is it in methane anymore that where you know methane produces co2 or are there are there other ways to bring that heat to the bring that heat to the table and and you know as jared pointed out you know what one of the ways is through through a thermal network i mean that that's you know a, a cop of seven is, is is remarkable right i mean that's that's a that's a very cheap uh british thermal unit it's a very cheap btu the, really. to, add, to add to that you know that that just going back to the time value of heat thing i mean you and i mark we've worked on a gas demand response program yes with national right. grid in yep. Brooklyn, Queens territory. I mean, we yes. could have a whole discussion on this program right. about that. So we did introduce time value of heat to a very large utility in New York City, right. um, you know, which has deployed a program. They're doing it right now. And there's a very specific window when heat or gas is more expensive. And it's right. in the morning, it's in the morning ramp up. Right. Right. When everyone's taking a shower, 
And they're ramping up heat in the building and commercial buildings as well to make it comfortable for the day, right? Um, so, you know, we, we know when heat is used. We could understand that pretty well. Um, we just need to make policymakers more cognizant of it so they don't drive us in the wrong direction. <laughs> but there you are, Jared, in, in New York with NYSERDA, which is probably, if not the best, it's one of the very best state uh, organizations driving energy efficiency and the adoption of new technologies, including renewable energy. Um, I mean, I, I, I often say, I wish we had an ICERTA here in Illinois. Mm -hmm. We don't have any more close to NYSERDA. And, um, you know, but, New Jersey, New Jersey says the same thing, <laughs> <laughs> but I will tell, I will tell you, right. There are other states that have agencies. Massachusetts is absolutely killing it. I mean, they are on point. Even Connecticut, right? They are so how so though? What what is Massachusetts doing? Because this is very interesting yeah. to our listeners. I mean, Massachusetts is one of the hottest uh, solar and storage markets. They have specific incentives for storage. Mm -hmm. They have a requirement that if you install a solar array of 500 kW or up, that you have to install storage uh, paired with that solar array. That's mm -hmm. very forward thinking. But what else is Massachusetts doing that's right? Right. So you might recall that they had a little bit of a problem around gas explosions recently. <laughs> uh, you know, everyone does. Uh, that's something that we just like to ignore, you know, that your house could explode. Um, they responded to that pretty strongly. There is pending legislation, which is thermal utility legislation, to take gas companies and turn them into thermal utility companies so that they are then allowed to start going into thermal energy network businesses. Currently, most of our public service laws, this is in New York, does not allow any, any utility company to start distributing thermal energy. That's not a gas. So you hear utilities talking about biomethane, renewable natural gas, and hydrogen, because it's a gas and they can put it in the pipe. The law itself calls out gas, it says gas. <laughs> it's pretty interesting that it says that, I don't know why maybe they were just simple in the 19th century or we're simple because we're using 19th century language in our public service law. So they are tackling that issue directly. They also have a pilot which is driven by an organization called Heat Massachusetts, H-E-E-T Massachusetts, um, to start doing thermal energy networks with Eversource, a gas utility, so that they could begin the process of thinking about gas pruning. So how do we start taking this network and trimming it back and eliminating the gas network and replacing it with a thermal energy network? Um, so they're, they're just so much further ahead thinking about these issues than I'd say most any other state. Uh, and, uh, you know, and it helps too, I guess, Mark, you know, Mark said this the other day, it helps that they're the, at the end of the pipe. <laughs> they also have a ship come in every, every week into Boston Harbor, right. with liquefied natural gas. I'd hate to see that thing go off. <laughs> right. uh, but, but let's yeah. keep in mind that we, we need to decarbonize the grid and, and so that's where I think green hydrogen really has a play. The Europeans are going mm -hmm. uh, long on this. The Chinese are going long on this. Mm -hmm. We're starting to, to hear rumblings in the US. I mean, right here in my, in my community of Champaign-Urbana, we have a green hydrogen facility being built to power hydrogen fuel cell buses. And uh, the, the electrolyzer is coming from Norway, a company called Nell. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I mean, truly, you can repurpose those pipelines and those ships to to move hydrogen. Not not exactly because of steel embrittlement, right? So all of, all of our steel pipe um, can't accept hydrogen up to a certain blend because the steel itself will become brittle and fail. Uh, check that out: hydrogen embrittlement of steel and and you know other ferrous metals um so because the europeans got, are planning the the europeans are definitely planning to repurpose natural gas pipelines with not green, extensively with green hydrogen not extensively 
they will look at trunk lines. Okay, they'll look at industrial areas, but their plan is thermal energy networks for most other users. And green hydrogen has a role in thermal energy networks where you need high quality combustion heat. Yes, you do, you do need it. It's part of the picture, but they will not rely on green hydrogen filling their entire natural gas network as, as it exists today. That's not their plan. Um, in fact, you know, a really great resource that you could look at is the European Union um, Thermal Atlas. It's called the Pan-European Thermal At Atlas, or PETA. <laughs> and they have mapped every single thermal resource on the European continent, from wastewater treatment plants to metro stations to existing thermal plants that are dumping their waste heat into waterways to the waterways themselves sewer sewer networks um anywhere you could find heat they've mapped it and they've actually mapped it down to the amount of petajoules of excess heat that could be captured and repurposed for use in residential and commercial buildings um, and also for industrial use so that's the direction that they're going in i mean god they're 35 years ahead of us like they just know <laughs> you know they know what to do but it helps when you've got you know vladimir putin there at the gas bow threatening to turn it off. Um, so green hydrogen, 100%. Green hydrogen for transportation, you know, freight, all of these things, totally. Industrial free. heat. Industrial heat. Oh my God, absolutely. Amo you know, using ammonia to transport hydrogen across oceans, a thousand percent. You know, this is, we will do this, right? Um, we also need to just, we need to green our existing hydrogen need, right? We're using hydrogen industrially. So before right. we just burn it for heat, we shouldn't be making hydrogen from methane anymore. We should be, we should be creating industrial hydrogen using green sources, right? Um, we need to do the same thing for ammonia. We need to do the same thing for fertilizer. All of those things are probably the priority on hydrogen instead of just burning it for heat. So. You know, we have to think about this holistically from an economic standpoint, also from a large systemic standpoint. Um, I really wouldn't encourage any uh, policymaker to continue allowing natural gas companies to put polyethylene pipe in the ground, spend rate-based capital money to do that for natural gas, because someday we'll put hydrogen through those pipes. I'd rather them start thinking about pruning their network and, and, and considering um, thermal energy networks, uh, you know, before we continue to throw capital at something that probably will not be, you know, it's just a physics thing. <laughs> well, I, I, my motto is it's both and. and it's both, uh, yeah, it is both. So, well, we're, we're almost out of time, gentlemen. I, uh, this, this is a great conversation and, and clearly we could go on for some time. Uh, I love this concept of thermal networks. So uh, I have a new a new vocabulary word, and uh, I will continue to learn more about this. What uh, what are your parting words for uh, for your audience? I, and I'm not sure who that is, but and and please tell our audience how people can find you uh, electronically. Eric, go ahead, George. Okay. Um, sure, you could, you know, you could find me at uh, emergentgroup.com. Uh, you know, reach out to me directly, learn a little bit more about me there. Um, you know, my, my audience is across the board, right? I work with municipalities, state agencies, building owners, um, individuals. Uh, I'm, I'm an elected official. <laughs> I try to bring my knowledge to the community that I serve. Uh, I'd say, you know, the, par the parting words are, well, first, another name for thermal energy network is ectogrid. <laughs> kind of like uh, ectoplasm from Ghostbusters, ectogrid uh, is another name for it, which is kind of fun. But parting words are, you know, let's not use the technology that we have today and the systems that we have today to come up with answers for the future, right? Let's take actions that enable change 
right? As simple as just eliminating the word gas in our public service law and replacing it with the word thermal energy. What high value, high impact actions can we take today to shift the paradigm, right? Change the Overton window. Can we just do that, those things please? Instead of coming up with the solution, right? I hear a lot of people saying air source heat pumps everywhere, right? It's part of the answer. It's not the final answer. And let's not try to jump in our minds to the final state. Let's figure out how we get there, right? Because the trip is funner than, you know, the destination usually. So uh, that's that's my appeal to, to everyone. Yeah. Um, you, you can you can reach me on LinkedIn. I'm I'm, I'm pretty prolific there if if, if you want to chat. Uh, and, and at at the end of the day, I, I I think I would I would echo exactly what you said, Sam. I mean it's it's both and right. I mean that that's that, that's the key. And, and whenever uh, you know whenever I see a situation where someone says, well, you know the the, the solution is in this. I, I want to take a look and say, well, maybe it's maybe it's more in in, in, in something else. And and on every you know for, for every supply side solution, there's a, there's there's a question about you know how elastic or inelastic is the demand curve, and does it make sense to assume the the demand curve is completely inelastic in the in these situations? And there are certainly entrenched folks who want to believe that, um, but at the end of the day, it's not uh, that 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 demand curve is very, is very elastic. And if anything's shown us. Any, if we've learned anything in the last 10 years, um, you know, if, if you would have told a solar developer in 2008, hey, the price of natural gas is going to be $2.50 on April the 14th of 2021, how many solar developers do you think would have gone into solar at that point in time? Right. None. And you, you just don't know. You just don't know what the, what, what the answer is going to be. Uh, and, and I would say that that might be the best thing that happened to the solar business was gas kept them competitive. And now that solar absolutely wins. So, um, you know, it, it's 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 a very dynamic, uh, a very dynamic market. And to and to to uh, to steal a title from a book, we got to build the bridges we walk on. It. And that's kind of kind of the way I would uh, uh, the way I would put it. And, and both and is, is is absolutely right there. So mm -hmm. uh, that's that's basically where I would leave it. Great. I want to make a couple of announcements before we say goodbye to our guests. The Solar Podcast and the Clean Power Hour can be found at cesnrg.com forward slash podcast. You see, you see here on screen uh, my interview with John Powers of Extensible Energy. Kimberly Sintera, Risk Mitigation for Utility Scale Solar Projects. Many manufacturers like Solar Flex Rack. We bring you projects like the University of Illinois Solar Farm. And then the Clean Power Hour, myself and John Weaver are breaking down the latest clean energy news on a weekly basis. So check it out at cesnrg.com. I want to thank my guests, Mark Kleingena and Jared Rodriguez for coming on the show and uh, educating me and our audience about uh, the grid edge and voltage control and the grid of the future. How do we get to a more resilient, reliable grid? Thank you so much, gentlemen.